here are the pictures in the middle of the chapter. This is my father in our maize field at age three with my father. So this is the author of the book. The village of Umbay and the trading center on the right. So this is the trading center in his hometown. Grandpa with his handmade bow and arrow. In the story, it talks about how he was a great hunter, provided a lot of meat for his village. In the library, this is him with all the books. My small radio windmill. This is his first windmill. A close-up of my big windmill. A close-up of the original tractor fan. You can see where he attached the blades. Outside Jacobo's school. So this is his school. Inside Jacobo's school. Wind farm in Palm Springs. Me on my Dartmouth College graduation day. This is when he finished college. Now let's complete the chapter. Joffrey and I had used regular sized water bottles for our pinwheels, but now I needed something stronger. Back at home, I started looking around and spotted just the thing. It was an empty jar of baby care lotion that my sisters used to play cricket. It was a plastic and shaped like a tub of margarine with a screw top lid. Perfect. Leave the lid intact. I removed the bottom with a bow saw, then cut the sides into four strips and fanned them out like blades. I poked a hole through the center of the lid and nailed it to a bamboo pole, which I drove into the ground. Behind the kitchen, right away, I realized the blades were too short to catch the wind. I needed to make them longer. In our village, we took our baths in a tiny hut made from grass that was open in the top. We typically installed plastic PVC pipe under the floors to keep them from flooding. Not long before my Aunt Chrissy's bathhouse had collapsed in a storm, so they built a new one right beside it. The old one was still there, however, and I knew there must be some pipe buried beneath the rubble. After 20 minutes of digging around, I managed to pull it free. I sawed off a long section, then cut it down the middle from the top to the bottom. Back in my mother's kitchen, I stoked the fire until the coals were red, then held the pipe aloft over the heat. The plastic began to wrap and blacken as it melted. Soon it was soft and easy to bend, like a banana leaf. Before it could cool down and harden, I laid it on the ground and pressed it flat with an iron sheath. Using the saw, I then carved four blades, each measuring 20 centimeters length. Once again, I didn't have the right kind of tools, so I had to improvise. This time, I needed a drill. Looking around my room, I found a long nail, took it to the kitchen. First, I drove the tip through a maize cob to create a handle, then picked the nail on the coals. Once it glowed hot, I poked holes in both sets of plastic blades. I used some wire to connect them to the bottle, but I didn't have any pliers to twist it tight. Instead, I used two bicycle spokes. That's when my mother found me. What are you doing messing up my kitchen, she said. If there was one thing she hated, it was the kids messing up her kitchen. Get your toys out of here. I tried to explain about the windmill and my plans to generate power, but all she saw were some mangled pieces of plastic and a bamboo stick. Even little children play with more sensible things, she said. Go help your father in the fields. But I'm building something. Something what? Something for the future. I tell you something about the future, she said, and scooted me out the door. It was pointless to try and explain. What I needed now was a bicycle dynamo or motor, and I had no idea where I would find one. Of course, I knew where I could buy one. A shopkeeper named Daunt had one for sale in his hardware store in the trading center. I'd seen it on the shelf for months before the famine, wrapped in plastic, so shiny and out of reach. I went back this time, and sure enough, it was still there. Drid smiled, and then I approached, so I tried my charm. Fine day, Mr. Drude, I said. Yes, fine day. Your family? Oh, fine. Thanks for asking. Say, how much for that dynamo behind you? Five hundred. 
I leaned forward and gave him the sorriest look I could muster. Yes, but you see, Mr. Dodd, I don't have 500. He laughed. Hey, you know how it works. Go find the money and come back. It will be here, and if not, I can always order another. I could get the money doing Ghana work, but maybe some odd jobs here and there. In fact, I'd heard that guys were making 100 kwacha a day unloading trucks at the dry goods store. If I worked a week, I could make enough money. I headed right over to the store and was the first one there. I'll get hired for sure, I thought. I waited and waited. Morning became afternoon. Then sun grew and dreadful. I had forgotten my water. Finally, the owner walked out. Why do you keep standing here, he asked. I'm waiting for the trucks. They come every day, he said, except Monday. Just my luck, it was Monday. That night at home, I hit another idea. The bicycle dynamo was the ideal motor for the larger windmill I wanted to make. But for this test model, I could get by with using a much smaller generator. I knew just where to find it. I walked over to Jeffrey's house and found him in the room. M. Bombo, do you remember where we put that international radio and cassette player? Yeah, it's here someplace. Why? I want to use its motor to generate electricity. Electricity? Yeah, from a windmill. Every time Gilbert and I had visited the library, Jeffrey said he was too busy working his fields. To be honest, he didn't seem that interested anyway. We're headed to the library, we'd say. Want to come? Go ahead, he'd answer. Waste your time. But now I told him my idea of building a windmill that would produce power and then showed him what I'd built so far. He saw things differently. Cool. Where did you get such an idea? The library. Jeffrey found the international cassette player under his bed, and I went to work. My screwdriver in this case was really a bicycle spoke that I had hammered flat against a stone. It wasn't anything pretty, but it worked to remove the screws from the radio's casing to allow me inside. After a little prying and jiggling, I removed the case and found the motor. It was half as long as my index finger and shaped like a AAA battery. A short piece of metal stuck out from the top of the stem. Attached was a small copper wheel that spun the magnets inside and gave the radio its energy. Using some wire, I attached the motor to the windmill. My idea was to have the body care lid turn the copper wheel as it was spinning like two gears in motion. But when I spun the lid, it just slipped against the copper. I needed some friction to make the gears catch. What we need is some rubber, I told Jeffrey. Yeah, but where do we get it? I don't know. What about from a pair of shoes? Now you're thinking the rubber from our flip flops was too spongy and not durable enough. Otherwise, we'd be set. Everyone in Maui wore flip flops. We needed a special kind of rubber, the kind used to make the flat worn by most women in Wambay. There was only one problem. A company called Shore Rubber was going through the villages collecting old shoes to recycle and make new ones. They were offering half a kilo of salt for each pair of shoes. Most women took the deal. I wonder if it was even possible to find shoes anymore, but it was worth a try. All day, Jeffrey and I dug through the garbage piles all over Manuea and Wambi looking for shoes. Finally, after sifting through a mound of peanut shells, banana peels, and old rusty cans, Joffrey held up a shoe. One shoe. Tanjani, the black flat had been buried so long it was now gray and filled with crusty muck. It smelled like goat skin. <laughs> Good job, chap, I said. Using my knife, I carefully carved an O-shaped piece out of the rubber, small enough to slide over the motor's copper wheel like a cap. This took more than an hour to do, but once I pressed it on, the two gears caught just right. The next step was to test this motor to see if it propelled or produced current. Jeffrey began spinning the blades by hand, and I took the motor, two wires, and touched them to my tongue. Feel anything, he asked? Yeah, tickles. Good, then it works. Now the question was, what should we power using this little windmill? We decided it would be Jeffrey's favorite radio, an old Panasat, Panasat, Panasonic that he listened to while he worked in the fields. Jeffrey loved his Billy Condo music, and sometimes he even snuck up on him in the maze rows and catch him dancing. I held the windmill with Joffrey, popped off the Panasonic battery cover, and removed the cells. Using my knowledge from the books, I assumed that because the radio operated on batteries, its motor produced DC power, which meant we could connect the wires straight to this radio's positive and negative terminals. Jeffrey pushed the wires inside, then twisted them so they connected to the heads. 
What do we do now? He asked. Now we wait for the wind to turn the blades. Just as I was saying that, the wind began to blow. My blades began to spin and the wheel began to turn. The radio popped and whizzed and whistled and suddenly there was music. It was my favorite group, the Black Missionaries, on Radio 2, singing in great song, We Are Chosen, just like Moses. I jumped so high I nearly disconnected the wires. You hear that? I screamed. We did it. It actually works. At last, Jeffrey said. Now I'll go even bigger. Superpower. The success of my small windmill gave me confidence to attempt an even bigger machine, and I'd already started making a list of materials. I would still use the PVC pipe for blades, though I didn't need much longer pieces. The blades would have to attach to a rotor, which needed to be some kind of flat metal disc. Plus, I'd need a shaft, an axe to make it all spin. The best thing I could think of was the bottom bracket of a bicycle. The bicycle, or gev as we call it, is what attached the bike's pedals to the crank set and turns the chain to spin the back wheel. But in this case, I'd replace the pedals with blades. When the back wheel spun, I'd give have a dynamo attached to generate the power. Basically, I was going to ho hoist a bicycle into the air like a flag to catch the wind. Just trying to imagine it made me laugh. But of course, none of this changed the fact that I'd still had no money to buy materials. So, like with a smaller machine, I had to go and find them on my own. For the next month, I woke up early and we went searching for windmill pieces like I was exploring for treasure. The best place I knew was an old tobacco plantation across from Kimco School. The abandoned garage and scrapyard were littered with machine parts and stripped bodies of cars and tractors, all forgotten and left to rust. Gilbert and I used to play around here, but never had much use for the junk. Now I was returning to the yard with a mission. I set out one morning over the hills and streams, noticed how the land hadn't changed much since the end of the rains. The grass was still high and starting to fade to brown, but the maize in the fields was tall and green. Soon we'd be harvesting and our problems would be over, at least for this year. At the school, I turned into the plantation and stopped the entrance of the scrapyard. Behold, now that I have an actual purpose and a plan, I realized just how much treasure lay before me. Old water pumps, tractor rims, half the size of my body, filters, hoses, old pipes and plows, several stripped car bodies lay bleached by the sun. In addition to the two abandoned tractors, they also had no tires or engines, just rusted gearboxes in their bellies. Inside the cabs, the glass was busted off the instrument panels, but the steering wheel, clutch, and pedals were still intact. Aside from the sound of the grass swaying in the wind, the scrapyard was silent, and I was beautifully alone. The first afternoon, I discovered a large tractor fan, the perfect design for my rotor. I could bolt the PVC blades directly to the metal blades on the fan. That same day, I found a giant shock absorber, which I banged against an engine block to knock off the chafe passing. Inside was a long piston, the ideal windmill shaft. I needed some kind of ball bearing to connect the shock absorber and gave to the friction. In order to find the right size, I used a piece of rope as a measuring tape and went around to all the various shafts with bearings attached. After three days, I found the right match on an old peanut grinding machine. I used a rusted coil spring to bang the beatings loose, and I found it was in pristine condition. The only problem with the scrapyard was that it sat directly across from the Cumbay School, where I'd left a bit of my heart. The school was currently empty until the students returned in a few short weeks. I could see through the windows. For a brief moment, I imagined myself back at my desk. Look out, I said. Your man, Kambara, will be there soon.